it's Mari Rahman. I'm the Area Director Punjab for the British Council, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Shavrat Haseen, who has come all the way from London to launch her new book, You Can't Go Home Again. Um, so, but welcome. Welcome to Lahore and the LOF. Um, we're going to kick off with a short reading of, uh, from, your, from your collection of short stories. Before we begin, can you tell us a little bit about the book? So, You Can't Go Home Again is my second book. It's a collection of narratively linked together short stories. The first one is about a group of Pakistani teenagers putting on a production of the Crucible, and during the course of their rehearsal, the one of them goes missing. And it follows the rest of the characters over their lives in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and kind of sees where they end up and how that event in their school years continue to haunt them all in different ways. So I'm going to read a little bit from the title story, which is in the middle of the collection, and it's about someone who's just been abroad to university and has come back to Pakistan for the first time. Since you've been able to drive, you've been going out to see and to think. Something that Shireen thought was pretentious. It's where you had your first accident, pushing into the sins minister's pajero as he took his daughter home from school. She has stolen your sleep. Most of the time you wake up, dreaming of her outside your flat, wearing that yellow sweatshirt and a row of bruises around her neck. And now you do not even want to close your eyes. So instead, you circle the city before the sun comes up. You drive past your old college and Nyla's house and your favourite tarbar and the box with, till you end up on TV, eating plant and smoking weed and watching the people from the cottages get up and go to work. You play your music too loud. You feed the crows and you look beyond the mazars and the shops where the city meets the sea, the decaying crust of the coastline, a parade of plastic bags floating up to the pier and you wonder how you ever ended up back here. Abbas got you working at his farm till you find something more permanent. You always used to say you didn't want to be one of those guys who only got a job because of their family, and yet this is your second one. You never show up before 10, and leave for coffee at 12, meeting Nyla at the espresso near her office. Every other morning, you convince her she is skinny enough to eat cheesecake, because you owe her that much at least. Within a few weeks, she is feeling warmer towards you, warm enough to let you drive her to an abandoned car park so you can push back the seat and her hands will trace the slope of your nose, the tight line of your mouth. She is terrified to find you kissing her with your eyes open. You look like a ghost, Karim, she says. What the hell is wrong with you? You tell her the city is curled into you like a tapeworm. It is eating you inside out. You're a poet, she laughs, adjusting her eyes. You just need time to adjust. I think that might be my first time reading from this book. <laughs> right, well. Right, so Sarah, the novel starts off in Karachi and then it goes around the world. Um, and the title of this book, You Can't Go Home Again. Can we begin by talking a little bit about yourself and what home is for you? So I was born in London, but then my parents moved back to Pakistan when I was in seventh Experiences of young people living in um, in the Karachi. I mean, you can see again what is that that sexuality that you experience uh, within Pakistan. <laughs> Look 
about the experiences of young people in Pakistan, how um, often novels set in Pakistan tend to be about an issue and want to grapple with sort of big things, but for you it was about the, the day-to-day lived experiences of young people in Pakistan. And that's there, the mundanity and the relatability of growing up in the 20, 21st century. Um, but at the same time, there's a strain of mysticism that runs through the book. There is some real horror as well. The, the, the first story, for example, is set around the kidnapping of one of the, the young people um, in, the, in, the, in the book. Um, and you said that your, um, your friend described it as gossip ghouls. So there's this element of the, the, the rich Karachi elite doing their day-to-day, but then there, there are churels and jinns and, and some real horror. Do you want to discuss that a little bit? Yeah, so I definitely didn't want it to be an issues book. I feel like a lot of the times young Pakistani writers or young South Asian writers in general feel like their book has to be about something. It has to be tackling something big and heavy, um, whether it's feminism or terrorism or something like that. Um, and I find that really... I think those things are important to grapple with, but I also think there's an element of that that is just people trying to justify the act of writing and the act of you know, making their lives um, visible. Um, so I definitely wanted this to be about, not necessarily ordinary people, but a very specific set of people. I didn't want it to necessarily be, you know, a, there's no moral to this. These are just people living their lives. Um, but at the same time, as you were saying, there is this other element running through it, this sort of like charge of horror. Because a lot of the time when you're looking at the lives of young Pakistanis from the West, for example, there is this horror running through it. There's, a, there's this idea of threat that's constant. There are all of these fears that teenagers in other parts of the world don't have to deal with. Um, and it's quite fun almost to make it, to take the real horrors and also add this mystical element to them and sort of have that bedded in with things that you are afraid of when you're a child and things that you're afraid of specifically if you're a Pakistani child and make it make it really specific. I think that was the other thing that was really important to me. I think I didn't want it to be a book that necessarily was trying to explain all of Pakistan to anyone. I didn't want it to be a book that someone would pick up and be like, oh, I understand what the whole country is like or what people of all different types are like. It's very, very specific. and. It's very specific, not just in terms of its time period. It's very clearly, I think, if you read it with some cultural references and things, it starts in the mid to late 2000s. And it's very specific to an age range within that, so the generation that was sort of like going to school around that time. Um, it's specific in terms of you know the kinds of school these children go to and all of that stuff. But I think that's okay. I don't think any one book should have to explain an entire country, and we don't expect that of other kinds of literatures, and we shouldn't really expect it of South Asian literature. No, absolutely not. Um, in a country of 220 million, um, <laughs> it's difficult with the disparities that we have. Um, I think you lose a lot of meaning and lived experience when you're trying to capture yeah. you know, the breadth of the country, um, and I think one of the strengths of this novel is the detail and the 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 familiarity with these characters, their, their lived experience, um, and so on. So I, I think that's, that's definitely one of the strengths of the novel. Um, what runs through the stories are a series of women characters who are very well defined and very different. We have a failed, well, not a failed, um, a scandalous, notorious woman who is a, a soap star. We have a fashion designer. We have Shireen, who gets two stories. Um, who um, grew up in Karachi and moves to London um, in Pakistan. Um, and they're all very different. Um, some of them far more relatable to me as a British Pakistani, um, and others like Naila, a young woman whose sole aim seems to be to, well, it's not her sole aim, but one of her main priorities in life seems to be to marry Kareem, her long, uh, six-year-long uh, boyfriend who, a bit of a commitment phobe, and just won't propose. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, and, and quite conservative, um, with some really conservative uh, belief systems. And I have to say, whilst I struggled with her character because I couldn't relate to her, her story was one of the strongest because it's told with a lot of compassion and uh, believability. 
So um, and she refuses to have a, a physical relationship with her boyfriend of six to seven years. Her aim is to, to get a ring on it. And, and, and then in a way, the, the story has kind of a sting at the end because she because it's a it's a I don't want to give anything away so there's a bit it's of a story about tale. how you can get what you want if you try really hard but it might not be what you want when you get there exactly so that one does have a role to it <laughs> <laughs> but um, the thing with Naila is you mentioned as well that some of your friends in the UK for example find her really hard to relate to and yet um, she's a very she's, you know when I spoke to friends in Pakistan they were like yes uh, we know this person yeah. how did you sort of cover the the, the cross-section of these women um, some of the challenges there and how did you manage to do it with such insight as well so I think one of the things that we were talking about earlier about the specificity um, actually makes it quite interesting because if you take a bunch of people who have roughly the same kind of upbringing, similar parents, parents are probably friends, go through the same schools, have a very, very similar um, start in life, and then sort of scatter them around the globe and see what happens and see where they end up, which is a really, which is a really fun way to write a book, actually. And I think that's one of the reasons this came out in short stories instead of a novel, because while they're linked and while all of the stories feed into each other and the characters' lives remain entwined as they grow older, it, it's quite interesting to just be able to get into each person's head and see, oh, this is what would happen um, to this person. It's kind of like if you um, look at the people you went to school with and see, you know, we all progressed in very different ways. Um, and Nyla's character actually really enjoyed writing that story because, as you say, she's a very specific type of person and I do have a writing workshop in the UK and some of my friends found it the line that you were talking about she's talking about her the possibility of two people living together before marriage and she's really scandalized by it which a lot of people will really relate to and find that completely something that they feel as well and for for a different audience that's almost a joke that's almost you know a miss a missed beat of, of humor um, but that's, that's fun because the story shouldn't just be in the writing, it should be in the reading as well. It should be in what people are taking away from it. And I don't think, much as we were saying before, you can't explain all of Pakistan in one book. You certainly can't explain all of Pakistani women in one woman. There is no sort of quintessential Pakistani woman, even if you're talking about a sort of like upper middle class, privately educated woman. They don't all have the same values or the same approach to relationships or the same. There's no cookie cutter formula. And I think sometimes when you're talking about Pakistani women, you do have all of these preconceived ideas of their relationship to religion or their relationship to their parents or, you know, all of these almost tropes are very um, obvious. And that, that was actually one of the things that came in when I was writing the story about soap operas because soap operas often deal with these tropes. So it was quite fun to take a character and have her you know, just dress up in various costumes and various characters and have her take on, you know, the part of the ingenue and then have her take on the part of the evil temptress and, you know, just explore all of these quite flat ideas of womanhood while inhabiting something far more complex and deep and dark herself. I have to say I've really enjoyed the character of Maliha, the soap actress, actually, and also the dabbler in black magic. Um, and when we spoke, you mentioned that, and I don't know if you are also a fan, that your mother is a big fan of soap operas. Do you watch a lot? Uh, have you watched many? And has it shaped in some ways um, your, your, um, your impression of Pakistan, especially today? Um, how, what, how, yeah, I mean, is there a connection here between soap operas, your relationship with them, and your mother, and this character? And I must say as well, I'd be really interested to know about the strain of black magic, magic that runs through, um, what, where that came from, actually. So the strain of black magic is probably the easiest question to answer in that. Um, I think for Maliha's character, who is someone who feels incredibly frustrated and incredibly contained by the sort of the restrictions on her life um, and how small her life feels and she's someone who I think has a lot of agitation and very much wants to, that's why she's a soap actress because she wants to live these very grand stories and these like huge emotions and there just isn't space in her life for them and so I think she comes to it out of a desire to make things happen and out of a desire to 
get some control over this feeling of helplessness that you can feel when you're a young woman. And I think not just a young woman in Pakistan, but a young woman living anywhere, or even just a young person who has ambitions that are greater than what is coming to them, who's waiting for their big life to start, and they're sort of stuck in this, this waiting room where everything seems really boring and no one is really getting what they're saying and she just wants to get to the next bit, she wants to get to the bit where she gets the hero or she gets, you know, into a big fight. She's just chasing that drama and I think her relationship to black magic and everything just helps her, helps her sort of try and fast forward that process, try and get her a step closer. I do not watch many Pakistani dramas, my family does, and I sometimes do if I'm in the living room when they're happening, and I have quite a teasing relationship with my mother where we we talk about them a bit and I find them a little bit, I don't necessarily find the dramaticness of them, but I sometimes find, as I was saying earlier, the characters a bit flat and a bit tropey and not necessarily nuanced portrayals of, especially women, I think. There's not necessarily many nuanced portrayals of women on those shows, and that frustrates me, and I think that's kind of why I wanted to tackle it in this panel. Yeah, you mentioned, actually, in the book as well, um, <clears throat> Maliha kind of alternates between being the young, white-dressed, sort of innocent, and then sort of the vamp, and she kind of, even in her personal life, seems to go between the two, which, um, which was kind of fun because it seems to be the two roles that mm. women are. It's the idea that you yeah. can only be one or the other, mm. that there's no sort of, that you can't contain that duality within one person, that you have to either be, you know, the temptress or you have to be the sort of very, the ingenue basically. Pure, yes, yeah. um, literally white robed, uh, yes. <laughs> innocent. Um, just a side question, do you have a favorite Pakistani actress? <laughs> Is she inspired by anyone in particular? <laughs> um, right, okay, so moving on to another character that I think is central, uh, well, I mean, I feel a lot of, some of, some of, a lot of the stories revolve around him um, and his relationships with the women, Kareem. I think we all know a Kareem, a bit of a player, um, commitment phobe, good looking tall guy, uh, rich, uh, a bit of a catch. Naila spends quite a lot of time trying to, to get him to marry her, for example. Um, he should be absolutely just, um, I, I mean, I wanted to hate him, and I have to say at the beginning I did, and then you get to his story, which is the titular story, um, the um, you can't go home again, and it sort of, and it comes at a point in his life where he's had to confront himself and some of the decisions that he's made. And actually, I thought it was the heart of the story. Um, I was surprised by how much empathy I felt for him, actually. But at the same time, a sense of you do get what you deserve, I guess. Um, how did you, and, and I know, and you'll talk about this, I'm sure, um, you've been working on that story for quite a long time. And I think it really paid off because uh, this character that in some ways we all know and is a bit of a cliche comes to life. Can we talk about him a little bit? So Kareem's story did start quite a long time ago. So I did a master's in creative writing and for one of my first year assignments, we had to write short stories and I hadn't really written one before. And I was trying to get to the heart of a relationship between two people who are much like Kareem and Shireen in this book. Um, and Kareem was a character who was incredibly privileged and um, had all of this male privilege and was sort of like coasting through life. Nothing was really touching him. Like he would mess up and his parents would bail him out or, you know, a rich uncle would bail him out and all of these things would fall into place with him. And then he has this relationship with Shireen and it sort of destroys him. And he comes back home to Pakistan after gallivanting around the world and has to confront himself in a way I think a lot of privileged young people don't necessarily have to until later in life or if at all um, but he's forced to do it then and the section that I wrote earlier is his homecoming and him coming home and realizing that the privileges that existed for him are maybe different or maybe tainted or maybe things that have happened to him have made him realize that he doesn't necessarily want to be got out of things anymore um, and so I really, really wanted to get into that character. And that's also why the story is the only one in the you voice, in the second person. Because I've always found that a very difficult voice to use. I think the I voice doesn't come very naturally to me. I write most naturally in close third. But the you voice is quite confrontational. And 
I started to examine why that was. And I, when I was writing this collection, I sort of came back to that story that I'd written a few years ago and realized that the reason it wasn't working is because the second person wasn't doing anything. It wasn't serving a purpose. It was just sort of ornamental. And I wanted to hit hard on this idea of almost a self-accusation. Like, he spends a lot of this time not necessarily atoning for the wrongs he's done. He's, you know, philandered and made lots of terrible mistakes, but confronting them. And there's this sense of accusation in it, like you have done all of these things and this is the life you've made. And not necessarily what are you going to do about it now, but just sort of facing your own demons. Yeah, it, the, the accusatoriness of it, um, it's almost like he's on trial. Um, yeah. That story in particular, I think that really helps maybe build my empathy towards him a little bit as well. Do you know Kareem? <laughs> I feel like, I don't necessarily know Kareem, but I feel like he's sort of an amalgamation of not just lots of people I've met, but also of, you know, everyone has those moments, don't they? Everyone has moments where they feel like they've maybe overstepped their boundaries or behaved carelessly with other people. I think that's... That's the key to Kareem, I think, not that he's cruel or an intentionally bad person, but that he's careless with other people's feelings, he's careless with his parents' money, he's careless with his, um, his health and his body and all of these things, and often as a young person, especially if you're a young person who doesn't have a lot to worry about, you are, and either you confront that or you don't. I was going to ask another question, and I, we will, I will ask it very briefly, but we, do, we will open this up to the audience in a minute. Um, this is your second novel, a uh, collection of short stories, actually, and um, they often say the second one's harder than the first. Um, the first uh, novel was This White Knight. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that uh, in relation to this collection, and then we will open it up to the audience. So they're both incredibly different books. So This White Knight was my first novel. Um, it sat in the 1970s in Pakistan and is maybe a bit more of a traditionally told story, just in the sense that it's linear, it's, um, you know, it's a novel as opposed to a collection of late short stories. And I wrote it, um, and while I was in the process of finding a publisher, I wrote these short stories. And I wrote them mostly for myself and for my writing workshop. And I wrote the first one, and they enjoyed it. and. I sort of kept playing with the characters. And there was this gossipy feel to it because they'd read the other story and be like, oh, so this person knows that one how, and this is how they're all linked. And they were enjoying the process of seeing the dots line up and seeing it come together. And it was almost, so these unfold almost like a game where there's secrets in the stories and then hopefully you find out the answer to whatever question you had in the next story. So they sort of, it's almost like a Russian doll um, thing until you get to the end. And that's very much a more linear novel, though that also has some elements of magical realism in it. Um, so they were very, very different to write and took incredibly different timescales, and the editing process was very different. And But this does feel like both a novel and a collection of short stories. It's very difficult to pin it down in either way. Absolutely. I keep on referring to it as a novel because I actually felt... Because it, it, was co it felt cohesive in a way, but there are also yes. chapters. Because you come back to the characters in the last story that you left off with in the first, and you've sort of traced them through each other's lives, um, so it should hopefully have this sort of like narrative thrust of a novel, even though it's in these bite-sized pieces. I did think of it when I was writing it, but one of the... Because they're very different stories, some of them are set in uh, London, some of one is set on a honeymoon in Rome, and some of them are set in Karachi and they're all in different time periods and things like that and in different voices but one of the things that was common really early on was that they were all coming out in roughly the same length which I know doesn't really matter but for me that was really important because it was I sort of think of them as these blocks of time almost like a tv show almost like an anthology tv show where you have what's common in that is that every episode is 50 minutes or something mm. um, even if the stories in them are completely different so that helps you sort of know where you are and keep to some sort of like narrative thread. I love the idea of this being a puzzle because actually that's what kind of kept me going through the, the stories. I just wanted to sort of put the pieces together. And because of the magical realism, I think there's points where you think, was that real or was that not? And then hopefully a few stories later you go, wait, 
that definitely wasn't real. Was it? Was it? <laughs> yeah. um, but it keeps, hopefully it keeps the question going. Um, so I don't know if anyone in the audience has read the book yet. I highly recommend it. But if you have, I'm sure you'll come up to Sarvath in a bit and ask us some questions, which I also actually want to ask you to answer those. Uh, I don't know if you will. <laughs> I don't know if you want to leave it to the audience, to, for the reader to figure out for themselves. But I, um, I definitely need to ask you a few questions. Um, speaking of which, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, anything at all? Rupa? We talk about um, this too open. I'm actually a speech on this eve on the Master of Creative Writing, which Jan Sebat was on once. So we talk often um, amongst ourselves as educators and writers about the difficult second piece. Because in the first one, you pour a lot of yourself into it and it's been building up for a long time. And then you're asked to write a second, and then we call we call that more difficult for many reasons. Was this was was there anything particularly difficult for in the creation and the work and the publication of the second piece? Did it cost you more in any way? It's interesting because I think we we do talk about that a lot on creative writing courses and amongst writers. I think there is it's almost like the second album type thing where you finish the first and you know hopefully it's gone well or it's gone badly, and you're carrying the weight of that nervousness into the second. So if it's gone well, you're nervous about how to follow it up. And if it's not gone well, you're nervous about writing something that will surpass it. Um, and I was very, very lucky in the sense that I didn't have that at all with this book um, for a couple of reasons. So I wrote um, my first novel, This Wide Night, um, while I was on the creative writing course. Um, I wrote the first third of it there and met my agent at the end of it and then sort of had him hold my hand through the writing of the next, the rest of it. And the time it took between me finishing This Wide Night and it finding a publisher was quite long. And I started, as I was saying, writing these short stories just for fun with um, the writing workshop that continued off my masters. And therefore, I didn't really think about it as a second book. I wasn't really thinking about them as a book until I started to put together some of the pieces and I was like, oh, this character, this is interesting, these two things are matching up. It's almost like putting together a puzzle um, and seeing that it was taking some form. So that was quite good. And I think the other reason it didn't feel like it had a lot of those second book problems is that I do think it's quite common for debut writers to, to either do this or to have the perception that they've done this where they've poured a lot of their own life into their first book. Like everyone always says, you know, the first novel is autobiographical and for the second one you can do you know whatever and a lot of my favorite writers have done this um like alexander chi's first book is a very thinly veiled um like novelistic memoir and then his second book is set you know during like the parisian opera it's very very different um whereas for me it's almost the other way around where the first book i had this incredible remove because it wasn't set it was set in Karachi, but it wasn't set in the time period that I grew up with Karachi. So it's like a close historical novel. Um, and it also had this remove of, you know, being set around, you know, like a family structure and a life that was very different to mine. Um, and it was from the perspective of, almost entirely from the perspective of a male narrator. So I had a lot of distance from that. Whereas when I was writing these, partly, I think the reason it didn't cost me more is because I wasn't thinking about it um, being a book, but, the people and their lives are a lot closer to mine because I am essentially writing about my generation and almost very consciously. Um, it's actually kind of, it's, it's one of those annoying ones that just poured out of me and I hate it when people say that. Um, I'm gonna get in trouble if I carry on going for much longer, but I do have a question, a uh, final one. Uh, what's next? So I'm facing the difficult third book problem now. Um, but I also, in addition to fiction writing, I do quite a lot of essays and some poetry and I'm writing a play at the moment. But the next book is a, I hate elevator pitching, it's a <laughs> modern day retelling of the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. And it's my first book that isn't set in Pakistan, it's set between Oxford and London and New York. And it's sort of like this big love story um, maybe more political than you can't quite ever get. <laughs> Hilariously, sorry, I just want to say that in the program, um, it misprinted the title of my book, which is You Can't Go Home Again, to You Can't Go Home Tonight, which is very different and much creepier connotations. 
Well, um, I'm going to wrap things up here. Thank you so much, so much. I'm actually very much looking forward to your next novel. I'm a huge fan. Um, I think you say that there's um, there's a hopelessness to this, but I don't think that there is. I think they're beautiful. I think they're real. And there's a poignancy, I think, that runs, a bittersweet um, element that runs through the collection. I very much recommend that you uh, get a copy. And while Servet is in uh, Pakistan, uh, get her to sign, um, yeah, get her to there sign are, it for you as well. Yeah, lots at liberty. And yeah. I am going to go over to the bookstore and sign some now. Thank you so much, Servet. Thank <laughs> you.